Hello and welcome to Season 2, Episode 72 of the Physician Assistant Exam Review Podcast. This week, we're going to be wrapping up EENT. My name is Brian Wallace. I'm the host and creator here at Physician Assistant Exam Review, and I am thrilled to be here with you today. I'm so excited to have you on board uh, and checking out the show and making progress through the blueprint as we are here and moving along. Like I said, I'm excited to be finishing up EENT. I think next week, next session, we're going to move on to GI. I haven't decided exactly yet, but I think that's where we're going to head. And I am thrilled to be doing that. So like I said, this week, we're going to be finishing up EENT. I've got a couple of just little things to wrap up there. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about last week's edition of the Physician Assistant Exam Review Podcast. During that episode, I very briefly mentioned the murder of George Floyd, the resulting protests and riots, and I offhandedly said we weren't going to cover them on this show because this show pertains more towards getting you through PA school, getting you through the pants, and that the racial issues going on in the country, in my mind at the time, didn't really fall under a healthcare concern, a healthcare question. Uh, I had a couple people call me out on that, and through very well-written and very heartfelt emails say, hey, look, you should definitely take a look at this and think this through a little bit more. And so that's what I did. I spent a little bit of time delving into that on my own, looking into this and where my blind spot was as to say that this was not a healthcare issue, the the racial divide in the country, and have come to the conclusion that obviously, (laughs) you you don't need me to tell you this, but that obviously it's it's a healthcare concern, right? And my role as an educator would be to bring that to the forefront because it does affect the way that you that we take care of our patients. It does affect the way that our patients view us. And it plays a major role in those relationships. So it's definitely something that is relevant to students, to practicing healthcare professionals. And it's something that we should definitely be bringing to the forefront here. So what I did was I took some time last week and in a forum where I have more where I can think a little bit deeper, where I can get my words across a little bit more clearly, which is through the emails. I spent a lot of time last week discussing these issues and going over them. So I encourage you, if you're not on the email list, or if you are on the email list and you didn't look through last week's emails for some reason, that you go back and take a look at those. If you're not on the email list, you can find over on the website, uh, you can find all the old emails in there very, very easily. And you can read through the discussion that I started last week on the topic of George George Floyd's murder and, like I said, the resulting protests and riots and the racial divide in the country and how that affects us as healthcare practitioners and some of the things we can do to improve uh, the way that we practice and improve our our practice for our patients. And I think that's going to be really important moving forward. So I just wanted to touch on that again today and point out sort of the, the blind spot, the mistake that I made in that last episode and point out to you a place where you can go and and see a little bit more clearly my thoughts and how I believe that that affects our community. So I I do encourage you to go check that out over on the website, uh, www.physicianassistantexamreview. You can pull up all the old emails and last week's emails cover all that in in a lot more depth and with a lot more clarity than I can provide here in the podcast. So with that being said, let's go ahead and move on and wrap up our discussion of EENT. And we'll do that by starting with the priming questions. All right, so for today, our priming questions. This is going to be a short section. Historically, the most common cause of peritidis. Peritidis. Historically, the most common cause was mumps. Obviously, with the vaccination for mumps, that's gone down considerably, but it's still something we all need to know about. What is the normal intraocular pressure? What is normal intraocular pressure? 12 to 22 millimeters of mercury. 12 to 22. What is the first line treatment for glaucoma? What is the first line treatment for glaucoma? Number one is going to be prostaglandins followed closely by beta blockers. All right, well, we really only have two sections to cover today. The first is just to wrap up ear, nose, and throat, which is with parotitis or salinitis. You're going to have have a blast with me in this one because I'm going to mispronounce a bunch of things, especially toward the end when we talk about some of the meds for this. And I... So parotitis and saladinitis are two separate things on the blueprint. And I spent some time looking through, and I'm hoping maybe somebody in the community can help me out and I can help clarify this to the rest of you 
I spent some time researching and looking through and trying to figure out how these would be different on your exam, what you need to know and what would change the way they're presented to you on your test. Cause that's the way we always do things here. We don't learn things in a vacuum. We would learn these two up against each other. And what I came up with was paratitis is the swelling of the parotid glands and salinitis is the swelling or inflammation of the salivary glands of which the parotid gland is the largest. You have the submandibular gland and you have the sublingual gland or the other two. So there are three of them. So it sort of branches out a little bit. But other than that, the presentations are similar. Everything else seemed pretty darn similar to me. I couldn't find a, a, a way to really split them up and divide them up. In fact, I, I had them as two separate categories as I went through this and I felt pretty silly basically repeating the same thing over. So I just mushed them into one. Again, if you have some insight into this and you can help me clarify that to the community, I'd really appreciate it. That would be wonderful. But it, as of right now, I'm going to cr cruise through them almost as if they're the same thing because I think they're, they're very, very similar and I'm not sure how they would separate them for you on an exam like we usually talk about. So the causes here are, could be viral infection, bacterial infection, and then autoimmune disease are another big one. Dehydration is a big one here as well, especially in your elderly populations. So that's something you're always going to want to keep an eye on. Viral infections, again, we talked, we didn't talk about it yet, but it was in our priming question was historically the number one cause was mumps. Parainfluenza and Epstein-Barr are probably are the most common now. And then HIV can also cause this. Staph aureus is the most common bacterial infection. And then autoimmune diseases are another way you can wind up with this. Um, if those glands get blocked by either a stone or or a mucus plug, that's another way you can wind up with this. But then again, I just, I just want to point out that dehydration, especially in the older community, is something to, to definitely keep your mind on, especially, you know, you might not get a test question on that. I could see them not wanting to put that down. But in your practice, it's definitely something can, to consider. Next, we have clinical presentation here. So that's facial swelling with pain. These are usually really painful. You can get some great images of, of kids, especially with the mumps, with these giant parotid glands, uh, they all have difficulty swallowing is another way you can pick this out. A treatment is really going to be supportive care and then appropriate antibiotics if, antibiot and the, if antibiotics are uh, indicated, depending on what we think the cause is here. But if it's a viral infection, we're just going to have to wait for that viral infection to go slow down. If it's something like Sjogren's, we're going to have to deal with that separately. If it's a stone, then we may in fact have to go in and remove it but it's going to be really dependent on our causes. And obviously, if it, if there's some issue due to dehydration, we're going to want to increase fluids. And then our next one for today is going to be glaucoma. So I, like I said, a very astute student pointed out that I had just randomly skipped over glaucoma on the blueprint, and she was wondering where it was. And I went back and I looked and saw that it wasn't anywhere. So here we are. We're just going to finish that up, and this will wrap up ENT for us. Uh, and then next week, we will be... I think I was going to move on to GI next week. Anyway, let's go ahead with glaucoma. This is an increased interocular pressure leading to damage to the optic nerve. This will lead to blindness that is irreversible. The aqueous humor is constantly being produced within the eye, and it's constantly draining out of the eye to maintain that pressure. There are four major types of glaucoma, which include open angle glaucoma. This is the chronic form. The closed angle glaucoma, which is that acute clogging of the drainage of the aqueous humor congenital gla glaucoma, and then secondary glaucoma, which is caused by systemic diseases such as trauma or steroids. Risk factors include advancing age. The African-American population is at an increased risk for this. The family history of glaucoma, diabetes, hypertension, hypothyroidism, and long-term use of corticosteroids. For clinical presentation, if we're talking about open angle glaucoma, this is insidious, and often the patients don't really have any particular symptoms, especially very early on. It's a gradual loss of peripheral vision is maybe the first thing they're going to notice. And this is why we're going to keep an eye on patients who have high risk factors for this, because it may be something that they don't notice right away. Acute angle closure glaucoma, uh, they have pain, may have nausea and vomiting, blurred vision, and they may see halos around lights. That's always one that jumped off the page to me with glaucoma. If you see that, it, it's really a red flag for glaucoma. Photophobia is also uh, another one that sort of jumps off the page here and makes me think glaucoma when I see that on a test. Lab studies and physical exam findings for open angle glaucoma. 
Um, an intraocular pressure of greater than 22. Normal is going to be about 12 to 22, something in that range. You can get a bowing of the iris. A visual field test will show decreased peripheral vision. So that peripheral vision is something you want to take note of when it comes to open angle glaucoma. You should always be testing visual acuity along the way. And you're going to perform a planoscopic exam, which is going to look for vessels bending over the edge of the disc or a cup to disc ratio of greater than 0.5. In a closed angle glaucoma, again, you're going to get greater than 22 on that intraocular pressure. In this acute, seriously acute phase, you can get pressures between 40 to 80 millimeters of mercury. You can get fixed mid-dilated pupils, red or hazy eyes. And on that fundoscopic exam, again, those vessels bending over the edge of the disc and that cup to disc ratio of greater than 0.5. Treatment here, we're going to start with prostaglandins. Those will promote drainage of the aqueous humor. And here's the part I'm really going to butcher. Latanoprost and bitamoprost are two that you can use here. Beta blockers are also another option and one that quickly follows up the prostaglandins because they will decrease the production of aqueous humors. Timolol and batexolol. Timolol seems to come up a lot here. Those are two you could use. And the, the third option, if these aren't working, is an alpha, uh, adrenetic, alpha adrenergic agonist. This decreases the production of aqueous humor and promotes the drainage. And if all else fails, you can do surgical correction. So you can use a laser to open the clogged channels. And then there's also a filtering system you can put in that will allow the, the drainage to, conti to, to continue. Our study tip for today. All right. Like I said, this is going to be a brief show because I'm just wrapping up some loose ends. Uh, the study tip for today, this is something that I did not do when I was in school. This was something I did not spend nearly enough time on, and I think it would have saved me an absolute ton of time, and, a, and it just would have made school so much easier. You always feel like you're pressed for time. You always feel like you're rushing around and you don't have enough time to study. You don't have enough time to think. You don't have enough time to do this. And I'm going to add something in here that you should be doing. But like I said, one of the things I like to look for are ways we can improve what we're doing, improve what we're thinking, improve the way that we do things and not just keep doing them the same way over and over. In this case, it has to do with how you're studying and one of the things I think you can, I absolutely should have been doing, and I think I'm going to encourage you to do, if you're still in school, is to spend a, a little bit of time before and after each lecture studying what's in that lecture. If you're not already doing this, this can save you so much time. If you spend five or 10 minutes before a class going over what you're going to be covering, they give you the outlines, they give you the slides, they give you tons of information. Briefly go through that. Just look at the headlines. Don't spend a ton of time because you don't know exactly what they're going to cover, but just go through the headlines. Mark up your notes during class, but then after class, take about 15 minutes and go back through what you've heard, what you covered, what you've highlighted. Organize your notes and go over it again. This multiple times touching this information will help it stick in your memory much better than almost anything else you can do. Especially while it's while it's already fairly fresh in your mind. If you can do this, especially just before the end of the day, before you before you move on to the next day, just spend five or 10, <clears throat> hopefully maybe 15 minutes cleaning up your notes, going over all this stuff. It will make a tremendous impact in your ability to remember the material moving forward. It's going to seem like you don't have time to do this. It's going to seem like you don't have enough time to get to any of this stuff. But what you're going to find is that when you go back to study it, you remember just a little bit more than you would have. And that will save you so much time on the back end that it's going to be absolutely worth it. And like I said, this is not something I did when I was in school. I, I, I was like so many other people thought that I didn't have the time to do this. I knew it was something people would suggest. In retrospect, this was probably one of the biggest mistakes I made while I was in school was not taking the time to touch on the material before and after class. Now that we've gone on and learned so much more, or at least I have, and I've been trying to pass it on to you guys, so much more about how the brain works, how the forgetting curve works, uh, how multiple touch points increase memory, how multiple sensations increase memory, doing these little 
extra time, I think, will have a tremendous impact in your ability to retain the information and understand it and then remember it when it comes up around again because all of this stuff comes up and around multiple times for you. It's not learn it once and it goes away. Uh, you have to learn it for your quizzes. You have to learn it for your tests. You have to learn it for your patients. You have to learn it for your pants. And when we go back and over and over and over all this stuff, we waste a lot of time relearning things we've already learned. So that's one way you can absolutely help yourself hang on to more of that information. All right, let's wrap it up with our answers to our priming questions. Historically, what is the most common cause of parotitis? Most common cause historically of parotitis, that was the mumps. What's the current most common cause? I didn't ask that in the beginning, but do you remember? What's the current most common cause of parotitis? Parainfluenza and Epstein-Barr. What is normal intraocular pressure? Normal intraocular pressure. About 12 to 22. And what's the first line treatment for glaucoma? Prostaglandins followed closely by beta blockers. And then third, we have alpha adrenergic agonists if those don't work. And then we move on to surgery. So that'll wrap us out and take us, finish us up for today. I do want to encourage you to go ahead and check out the email list if you haven't gotten on there yet absolutely head over to www.physicianassistantexamreview.com and you will easily figure out how to get on the email list. That's so that I can communicate with you readily when new things happen, when new things come up, when new ideas strike me, and also so that you can, I can pass along to you so many tips, tricks, techniques, and ideas. I email five days a week, every weekday, on all different thoughts as far as the pants goes, the rotations go, uh, with all different types of ideas, but especially, like I said last week, when I took some time to spend some, spend some extra time reflecting on the murder of George Floyd and the racial divide in the country and how that affects healthcare and how that affects each one of us as practitioners, uh, that was something that I really encourage you guys to go back and read. If you're not on the email list, to go back and check that out. And if you're not on the email list, also go ahead and sign up for the email list so that, so that I can so that I can reach out to you and have those discussions with you and we can go back and forth like I did with a bunch of people there. Uh, I do encourage you to head over to the website and check out all of those resources. Definitely uh, worth the time and effort. www.physicianassistantexamreview. And until next time, I look forward to talking to you again and good luck on your exams. Mm-hmm.